Welcome to week number three of our series entitled Next Gen. Uh, desiring to raise the next generation to, to know they're loved by God, that God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, and, and to have a generation that also loves Jesus, that follows us, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Here's something I know to be true. There's not much that you could say to me that's going to push my buttons, cause me to be disappointed in you, or, or really want to get into a heated conversation. Here's what I mean by that. Ohio State plays Wisconsin, and Wisconsin wins, and, and you'll think it's really funny and entertaining to text the pastor, show up to church, uh, and give him a hard time. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, well played, good job, you guys deserve to win. Uh, you're, you're not going to get that far under my skin that I'm going to lose it, as much as I might want to. And there's not much you could come into my office and say, Pastor, I, I, I'm not sure if I should be here. I don't know if I should talk to you. Uh, there's something that's on, been on my heart. I, I feel loaded down with guilt. And, and I'm afraid if I tell you, you're going to be so disappointed in me that you're going to kick me out of church because no one would ever want to sit next to me if you know what I've done. And here's the reality. I've probably heard it before. And it wouldn't shock me because I, I know sin is real. And, and I'd want you to tell me because I, I want you to hear what God has to say about it. You're forgiven. There's nothing you can do that will make him love you less. And maybe just maybe you'll get upset about a decision the Board of Education or the church council makes and, and you call me up on the phone and, and you let me have it for every reason that we made a horrible decision. And I'll probably ask you some questions and, and I'll try and be patient and, and I'll offer to pray at the end and, and I'll tell you to come back and talk some more later. I, I'll do everything in my power not to, to lose it or get into a heated debate. But there are a couple things that if you said them to me, you might cause me to get a little bit hot and, and respond. Uh, there are two phrases, literally, that, that really will do that to me, and I'm not sure, but they probably would do it to our other pastors as well. And, and they're fairly similar, and, and it goes like this. Pastor, it's not my job. It's yours. Or the variation, Pastor, it's not my job. It's the church's job. And now before you get upset with me and walk out of here, understand what I, what I mean by that. I understand that the Bible clearly says to pastors there are certain things that we're called to do, certain things that are our responsibility. I also know that the Bible clearly talks to the church and says these are things the church is to do. But usually when people say those phrases to me, it's not about those kind of things. It's about these. It's about evangelism. Like, people will literally say to me, Pastor, that, that's not my job, that's your job. Like, you called a pastor to do evangelism. It, it's not my job to tell people about Jesus. And you know what I say to that? That's not true. That's wrong. And, and it, it's one of those things that will push a button. Here's another one. Your cousin Sally offended you and, and took extra money out of grandma's inheritance that, that she shouldn't have gotten because she was in charge of it. And you come to me and you say, Pastor Tim, you got to go deal with my, my cousin. Like, you need to tell her how sinful it is and wrong and, and make her give me back the money. And you know what I'm going to say? That's your job. That's what the Bible says. You go to her and talk to her about this. And then there's one more that this usually comes up when. And it's why it's the tension point of today based off of last week's message. Pastor Bill and Pastor Mike, who, who preached on this message, they preach to our church about the role that parents are to have as primary in raising up the next gen, to, to be spiritual leaders, to, to be spiritual places where, 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 where children are blessed and they hear the word of God. But, but you know what we oftentimes hear from parents? Because a lot of you left last week going, that was a great message, but it's still your job, <laughs> Pastor Bill. It's still your job, St. Peter's School. It's, it's still someone else's job. It's, it's not mine. It's, it's yours to, to raise them up to know Jesus. And that's where the tension is, right? Because none of you left last week going, Pastor Bill and Pastor Mike, you're wrong and sinning with the message that you proclaimed, that, that dads and, and, and parents are primary. But there's a part of you that said, but it, it's still not all my job, it, it, it's yours. And that's what we got to talk about today. Because if we don't get this right, if we truly don't understand the, the role that parents have and the church has in raising up the next gen, we're going to see the next gen disappear. I just believe that to be true. Like parents, if you really believe that it's Pastor Tim and Pastor Bill and Pastor Mike 
and Pastor Jim and Pastor Michael's responsibility alone, then, then we're in trouble. And if we tell you it's not our job, it's yours, and you got to do it all alone, you're going to do something that's very hard and very difficult, and, and, and the next gen might be in trouble, not because you don't care, but we need both. It's not an either or, it's a both and thing. And today I want to dig into to God's word so that you can see what, what God has to say about raising the next gen and, and the church's role in that. And I pray that you'll find three important truths that, that we as a church need to take on. There's a famous African proverb, Hillary Clinton stole it and made it a book title and many people think she came up with it, but it's an African proverb. It takes a, a village to raise a child. And in, in the world we live in and in life, we, we know and we can see how, how that is true. And today I want to post to you that it takes a spiritual village. It takes a church to raise the next gen to love Jesus. That, that parents are our primary, but the church serves a great purpose and can be a great blessing uh, to the next generation when we, when we do it God's way. And I want our church to be a part of the church that, that sees the great role and responsibility and carries it out to make a difference. And I think you want the same, don't you? Like those of you who are here for Bridget today, you want that for her. You want her to know Jesus and love Jesus. And if God so chooses, she grows up and gets older and is blessed with a family, then, then she can pass it on, right? So what does that look like for us as a church to make sure that happens? Well, well these three things I, I think are vital and important for us to do. And we're going to turn into God's word and we're going to see how raising the next gen to love Jesus needs a village, a spiritual village, a church family that does these three things. At first, it's a church that does this, that owns its role. Parents, last week we talked about you as primary, and we need you to own that role. Dads, we have a great and amazing blessing in our church with a family pastor who, who longs to be a, an encourager to, to you in your role, and we want you to own it. And, and moms and dads, we want you to own it in your homes, that you're having devotions with your kids, and you're raising them to know Jesus. But we also want to be a church that owns our role. We don't want to take your role from you. We don't want to give you the impression that it's, that it's our job or, or yours alone, but we want, to, we want to own our role as well. And here's what the church's role is that we need to own. Three things, three passages. The first one is words you heard before from Ephesians 4, where the Apostle Paul reminds us that Christ himself gave the apostles, those were the 12 that were sent out, the, the, those early church leaders, the prophets. It's a Bible term for someone who speaks God's word to God's people. It was an Old Testament title. The evangelists, people who proclaim the gospel, God gave some uh, that, that gift and responsibility to be missionaries to go. And he also gave pastors and teachers for a purpose, to equip his people for works of service, for the purpose of building them up so that, that we all grow in our faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. In other words, the church's role is to, to equip, to equip God's people in all their godly callings. If you are a husband or a wife, it's our job to equip you in that godly calling of, of being a husband or a wife. If you're a parent, it's, it's our job to help equip you in, in carrying that role out so that, that your children can grow in their maturity of their faith and you can grow alongside of them. It's, it's our role to equip you in, in, in the roles that you have at work and, and friendship in the community to, to evangelize. It's our, our role that we need to own to equip you. So you know what we've has done as a church? We've called a pastor to be the family pastor, <laughs> to help parents it, 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 who have those roles and those godly callings carry them out. As a part of this series, we've had a fuel session where, where Pastor Bill and Pastor Jim are, are digging into God's word and giving practical advice for parents to carry out that role in the 21st century, which is so hard. Because everyone in here who's a grandparent has done this to their kids and their grandkids. I'm so glad that I'm not raising kids in this generation. It's so difficult, right? And every one of you here heard your grandparents say it to you. There's a reason. It gets harder. The world changes. Sin is real. And it's a tough, tough role. And we want to do everything. So, so those sessions are, are available. And Pastor Bill is doing a Lead Me Father project to help dads be spiritual leaders in their home because we know the stats, what they tell us when dad is into God's word and, and a spiritual presence. Oh, things change in the home. We're, we want to equip you. And that's our role. And as long as I'm the pastor here and, and I'm the lead pastor, we're going to do that as best we can. Because we want you to be blessed in your homes and in your lives, whether you're a parent or not, to, to be able to grow in the knowledge of God and to be equipped in all of your godly callings. Because our big God wants you to, to know this to be true, and, and he's given us a big job. And we want to own it. 
But there's more. And not only is it the church's role to, to equip God's people for works of service, but it's also just like the role that, that Paul encouraged a young pastor named Timothy to carry out. Look at these words that he wrote to Timothy. As for you, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of. In other words, live your faith, uh, you leader in the church, Timothy, that you are. And how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I make you this promise. We as a church are going to use God's word. We are going to teach your children, whether they come to our Bible discovery program, our vacation Bible school, or you use, utilize our school and partner with us in that. We're going to dig into God's word to, to rebuke and correct. We're going to we're going to talk about sin and, and we're going to talk about grace. You're going to get 200 proof truth and you're going to get 200 proof grace when, when you walk through the doors all the time. We are going to correct and we're going to train. We're going to want to encourage and instill in you values that are godly. And we're going to do that. We're going to use the means of grace so that, so that your children, the next generation, and every generation is wise for salvation. Now, some of you know this. My, my son is going to school right now. He wants to be in the medical field one day. He he may want to treat people who are wrestling with cancer or orthopedics is the other thing. You know, I hope he's got a lot of good, good teachers who down the road teach him how to do those kind of things. Because you know what, if I have an issue with my wrist or I need a hip replaced, I hope he knows what he's doing with that scalpel. He needs to be wise <laughs> in how to operate. As a church, our, our, our role isn't to make you wise for your earthly job. It isn't to make you wise on, uh, on things of this world. It's to make you wise for things that last and matter to eternity, to make you wise for salvation. To talk about Jesus, to talk about grace, to, to point you to the cross and the empty tomb, and, and we're gonna do that, that's our role. We're gonna assist you parents in, in doing that, whether you, you send your children to our Christian grade school or, or you choose to use a public school in town, which is an amazing place for an education, and you come here on Sundays and Wednesdays uh, as we share Jesus with your kids, we're gonna do that. But there's only so many pastors and teachers and staff. And the church's role is to, to, to equip and to, to educate and to teach and to, to talk about Jesus. But, it, but the church's role is bigger. It's not just me, it's also you. And you need to hear this. There's only five of us pastors. And, and you know what, on a Sunday morning, one of us is preaching and, and one of us is teaching and another one is teaching. And we have a Bible discovery going on where where we need people to help teach. <laughs> and we need people to do that. And you know what, we, to operate this kind of ministry, we need your gifts financially. And they're blessing us because they help us offer all these things that, that help us equip and, and teach. And, and that's where you come in and, and you need to know your role in this, that it's not just the pastor's job or the principal's job or a teacher's job, but look at the Apostle Paul in Romans describing the church's role in this that we need to own. Each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function. Here's the spiritual truth. So in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to God's grace, which is given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy. If it is serving, serve. If it is teaching, teach. If it is to encourage, give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently, do it well. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. We as a church need to own that, that each of us has gifts and talents and, and plays a part in the whole to, to raise up the next generation. Pastor Jim has a great gift of empathy, but you know what? He, he, he can't be there to put his arm around 2,000 people all the time. He can give encouragement, and, but there's so many hours in the day where, where we need other people to be encouragers. If that's your gift, I pray that you would take that on. If, if your gift is, is that you've been blessed with resources or, or maybe you're in your retirement years or, or maybe you're younger and, and you've been blessed, the, the gifts that you give help provide the things that we do, the ministry that we carry out, then give generously. <laughs> do it with a cheerful heart because God loves a cheerful giver. If it's to lead, if you've been given gifts in that area, can you use those to bless our church, help us make good decisions, be wise? Like, like we need you to help us see the future and be strategic for our school and for our church and for our mission and our, and our vision. If it's to teach, might you help with our vacation Bible school, our Bible discovery program? Can you get plugged in to, to be someone who passes it on literally on a, on a Sunday basis? Well, whatever your gift is, understand how powerful and important role it plays in, 
in passing it on to the next generation because we need you. The whole body needs you. And, and, and it's not just my job. And it's not just Pastor Bill's job. And it's not just the five pastors in a room's job. It's, it's God's people's job to use all their gifts to, to bless others. And I think amazing things will happen if the church owns its role. Like if we continue to be a place that, that desires to equip you and, and build you up and increase you in your faith and encourage you, if, if we make front and center God's word and, and Jesus Christ and, and, and salvation and, and the, the ultimate thing that matters is heaven and, and we talk about that over and over again and if we use our gifts, I believe the next generation will be blessed. But I believe we need to do two other things in light of that. Because we need to be a church that owns its role. It, it takes a village spiritually to, to raise a child today. We all have roles in it, parents and church, members of that one body. But there are some practical things I really want you to, to, to take away today to, to do. Because if we do them, I believe that we can raise the next generation to love Jesus. And, and it needs to be a place in a, a spiritual community, a, a village that does these two things. Uh, the first one is this, uh, that we are a church that one another's each other. And you might say that doesn't make sense. It, it does if you know the New Testament. Over a hundred times in the New Testament, there are passages about how the Christian is to one another, another Christian. Forgive one another, love one another, be hospitable to one another, serve one another, love one another, over and over and over and over and over again, the New Testament church is encouraged to not do life as a solo mission, but to do life with one another. And that goes counterculture in today's world. Because you know what people like to do in today's world? Solo missions. They like to drive into their garage, push the button before they get out of the car, go into their home and never see their neighbor. They don't want to talk to people. They, they don't want to... They, they, they want to do it on their own. And, and we can't be a church that does that because the next gen it needs to, to see something different. Because here's the thing I believe is true. The word of God is powerful. The Holy Spirit will break down walls and break down hearts. But you know, the human mind and the human heart is hardwired to, to this truth. Actions speak louder than words. And there's power in one another and each other visibly displaying what it looks like to, to walk together to, to one another in life. And I know this to be true. From a worldly perspective as a, a parent, I remember the day when, when my daughter was born, we were in St. Joseph Hospital in Milwaukee. And, and they signed the papers and, and they said, you guys, are, you guys are free to go. Like we walk out the door, we got her in this little car seat, we, 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 we put her in the car seat, we buckle it in, like we're, we're gonna be super good parents, we're gonna keep her safe. And I think I got behind the wheel and Holly's in the seat next to me and I, I don't know if we had this conversation, but at least in my heart I was thinking, what in the world are we gonna do next? Like I have no clue. I've never changed a diaper in my life. Like I didn't help my mom change my little brother's diapers. No way. Like and how do I burp this kid without getting spit up all over my face and clothes? And how are we gonna like deal with not getting any sleep. I mean, in the hospital, my wife could push a button, they'd come and take the kid away and she could sleep all night. They don't do that in your house. <laughs> like first time moms, you know this. But you know what happened in our life? Someone one another does. My mother-in-law. Like she said, I'll give you a week, I'll take a week off of work and, I, and I'll come and stay with you. I'll, I'll vacuum the floors, I'll, I'll make the meals. <sighs> I'll give you advice. I'll be a shoulder to cry on. She was there. And that's what we do for one another. We need to be a church that, that is willing to one another people in their, in their godly callings. Like if you're a, a person who has parented and, and you're beyond that, I, I, maybe you can one another by encouraging. It's the passage I want to share with you from Acts chapter 11. There's this guy named Barnabas in the Bible. You know what his name meant? Son of encouragement. Like he was the guy always smiling, Mr. Positivity, encouraging, courage, encourage. And here's what the Bible tells us. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. That was the, uh, the location where the, the Christian church had exploded. That's where Saul was persecuting the church, but now he'd become this great believer. And 
The people in Jerusalem are scratching their heads going, is there something crazy going on up there in Antioch? Are they doing it the right way? So they sent Barnabas, son of encouragement, to go and see. And here's what the Bible tells us about Barnabas. When he got there and saw the grace of God and what it had done, he was glad and he encouraged them. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit. You see what happened? A great number of people were brought to the Lord. Actions speak louder than words. Barnabas one anothered them and he encouraged them. And you know what he did later? He took Paul, who formerly was Saul, on a first missionary journey, and he encouraged Paul in his godly calling. And, and Paul became the great missionary to, to walk the face of earth. He wrote half of the New Testament because Barnabas took him under his wing and walked alongside of him, and many people wouldn't have. And then you know what Barnabas did? He had a disagreement with Paul about John Mark, that, that guy who, who walked out on Paul. And Paul said, I can't trust him. And, and Barnabas said, but, but he needs to be encouraged. He's going to be a, a great pastor someday. And, 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 and Paul said, not for me, but Barnabas, he, he walked alongside of him. And you know what happened later in life? Paul said, send John Mark to me. He is a blessing to me. And that happened because of the encourager. And I think we can be a church that affects the next gen by being Barnabases in the lives of others. I know there are kids in here who are going to scream and, and kick and fuss. And I know we have special areas where we allow you to sit. And I know for some of you who've done your raising, when you come to church, you want it quiet and peaceful, but do you remember how hard it was to raise a child and bring him to church? Like, I got to stand up front, and I saw my kids and how poorly behaved they were at times, and I got home, and my wife was like, here they are. Like, it's hard. My wife did it solo. Might we be a church that instead of giving the, the ugly stare, like, can you keep your kids quiet? Can we be the place that, that after church today, when you walk out, you go up to that parent who had four little ones here and say, I know it's hard, I've been there. You can do it. I thank you for bringing them to church because I want them to know about Jesus. So, so I'll put up with a little bit of noise and some drop Cheerios and some crumbs on the floor because I love that my church wants the next gen to be in church. And, and maybe just maybe you can be an encourager to those parents. As you see them struggling, can, can you be the person who maybe reaches out or sends a message to, to someone you know? How can we be encouragers? How can we one another, like the Apostle Paul says in, in the book of Romans, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourself? How can we one another each other? I, I don't know what this looks like, but, but I have some ideas. Like, like maybe if you're a godparent or a sponsor to, to a niece or a nephew, can you one another them and show them that they are loved, that, that you want to invest in their life? And, and maybe just maybe on their baptism day, you offer to take them out to, to a meal. Like as great as their birthday is and you give them a gift that day, take them out on their baptism day and, 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 and let Brecken go to Hoo-Hot where he can eat all the food he wants. Like that's my godson. And I'm a, not a great godparent when I have never done that. But I might this year because I told him I would in the last service. <laughs> and he won't forget because there's food involved. And, and maybe we can one another each other and honor someone else above ourselves when, when we've done the parenting thing and like my wife and I, we're beyond the kid raising. Like we get to go on date days all the time because we don't have kids to watch on Friday night. But I know, the, I know how hard it is. And maybe if that's you and you've been blessed, how about you stop at the script stand after church on a Sunday and, and get a gift card to a restaurant and, and give it to a young couple here at church and say, I know how hard it is. But I want to honor you. I want to be devoted to you. I want to one another you. Here's a meal. It's one of my favorite restaurants. Would you go? Uh, the food's on me. You just got to find a babysitter. And if you can't find one, I'll come over. I know they'll never take the pastor up because they won't trust me after what I admitted about parenting today. <laughs> like, how can we one another each other? With a meal for a new family, with a word of encouragement, with a, an armor on the shoulder. How do we do that? Because I believe actions will speak louder than words. When, when your children, the next generation, sees love in action, sees that you care, sees Jesus in you, they will see love. And, and they'll wonder why. And then when we do that, we can celebrate this last fact, which I believe is vital. To raise the next gen to love Jesus, we need to be a church that does life together. It's one of our vital mantras that, that we're in groups. Because when you're in groups, you have a village. There are other people around you. Maybe your group is made up of school families because that's who you're connected to. Be there, support each other, encourage one another, do life together. Share the struggles, tell them what's going on in your life, talk about the the things that are on your heart, and ask them to pray for you. A church that does life together, parents that do life together, a church family that, 
prays for, supports, and does life with their church families will be blessed. The next generation will be blessed. Look at these words from, from God in Philippians 3. Paul says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. A lot of people know my kids, and uh, I, I think they're amazing kids. Uh, and they'll sometimes say, how did you raise such amazing kids? And I go, two things. My wife and the grace of God, because if it was up to me, horrible. It, it wouldn't happen. And, and then I saw this verse. Like there are people in their lives who have modeled this. Godly grandparents who love Jesus and have encouraged them. Sponsors who have been there and supported them and, and encouraged them and modeled for them. And Christian teachers at, at St. Peter and, and Christian pastors at, at St. Peter and, and Christian professors and teachers at Fox Valley who, who modeled it for them, that they looked up to, that, that, that they were encouraged by. They did life with their church family and they saw life being done in Jesus in action and it impacted them. It, it wasn't by chance or luck. It was by God's church, a village. And we need to be that for one another. So if you're a new parent, if you're a parent, maybe you have someone in your family that you can model yourself after, an older sister. If you're the older cousin, how can, how can you model it for your younger cousin? If you're a grandparent who, who, who now has grandchildren who are getting married, how do you model and encourage them in their role as a, as a wife or a husband, as a, as a parent? Like, like, how do we do that for our brothers and sisters? Let them know that we're praying for them, do life together, and, and find Christian godly models and mentors. If you're looking for this, reach out to one of our pastors. We will connect you to, to a godly person who can be a model and a mentor for you. We'd love to do that. I'm kind of scared to just put that out there, but, but, we'll, but we will. And I think if we did, we're going to find that the next generation will be blessed because they'll see love in action. They'll see Jesus' hands and feet in you and in me. So here's the deal. A couple weeks from now, you can feel free to come up to me and say the phrase, Pastor Tim, it's not my job and it's not your job. It's our job. It's our job as a church as a village, to own our role, to one another each other, and to do life together. And when you come up to me and you say that, I will say amen. How can we do that together? How can I encourage you in that? How can, how can we be the church that God longs for us to be so that the next generation and every generation and, and our generation is blessed because they know that they're loved by God and they've experienced and seen the love of God in God's people, in their village. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that I've been blessed to have a village. I, I thank you for godly parents that, that walked me into a church and took me to a baptismal font, just like Bridget's parents did. I, I thank you, Lord, that you've blessed me with, with Christian teachers, with Christian pastors. I think of Pastor Rail. I, I think of the teachers I had in grade school and in high school, and even through the seminary who modeled what it looked like to, to see the love of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for, for godly people in my life, for, for the blessings you've given to me uh, that, that allows me the opportunity to model it for others. And I thank you for all those who are here today, O oh Lord, who have parents like that, who've had a church like that, who've had others in their life, because it takes a village, a spiritual village, a church, to help raise the next gen. And we don't want to be a place where the parents are left to do it themselves. So, so let us, Lord, as a church, own our role and do it well to your glory. And, and let us one another each other with encouragement and support. And let us do life together. Because when we do, I know the next gen will be blessed. Because they'll be loved and they'll know they're loved most of all by you. I pray for this, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.